Tonight on EIV News at 9, Super Tuesday brought many surprises to some Democratic and Republican candidates. Political correspondent Stacia Cody will have the details. And Spotlight wins big at the Oscars. How the movie about the Boston Globe took the top spot in Hollywood. And the MBTA officially cancels late night tea service. What will this mean for Boston commuters? Hello and welcome to EIV News at 9. I'm Angelina Salcido. And I'm Anthony Monzon. We begin tonight with a look at the Massachusetts presidential primary and Super Tuesday. That's right, Anthony. We're joined now by our political correspondent, Stacia Cody. Stacia, how did the Republicans react to Super Tuesday's results? Well, Angie, over 8.5 million Republicans turned out to the polls Tuesday, which was double the amount of voters who turned out for Super Tuesday in 2012. While Republicans are as enthusiastic as ever, exit polls show that the grand majority of Republican voters feel dissatisfied or angry with the current federal government, and they're now looking to Donald Trump for, in the hope that he will bring about necessary changes. Though GOP candidates Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio expressed doubt that Trump would be taken seriously in such a pivotal election. Trump won seven of the 11 Super Tuesday states, with Massachusetts accounting for Trump's largest victory. Now, Trump's delegate count stands at 319, which is less than 100 more than Cruz's 226 delegates. After Super Tuesday's results, Cruz is contending that candidates like Marco Rubio and retired neurosurgeon Ben Carson are diluting the votes of Republicans against Trump, and that the best way to block, Trump no block Trump's nomination is, to choose is for those candidates to drop out of the race. Former Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney has issued scathing remarks about Donald Trump. In a speech earlier today at the University of Utah, Romney warned the packed auditorium that Trump was unsafe for the future of both the party and the country. He urged voters to support for one of the other remaining GOP candidates. Now, I'm far from the first to conclude that Donald Trump lacks the temperament to be president. After all, this is an individual who mocked a disabled reporter, who attributed a reporter's questions to her menstrual cycle, who mocked a brilliant rival who happened to be a woman due to her appearance, who bragged about his marital affairs, and who laces his public speeches with vulgarity. Donald Trump says he admires Vladimir Putin. At the same time, he's called George W. Bush a liar. That is a twisted example of evil trumping good. Romney is adding his voice to an increasing number of Republican Party members disavowing the New Jersey businessmen, including Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker, who said he would not vote for Trump come November. That's right, Stacia. And when Governor Baker made this announcement, our reporter Ross Ketchke headed out to see what his constituents thought. Ross Ketchke here for EIV News, standing outside of the State House in Boston. As the 2016 presidential race is shifting into full gear, candidates in both parties are beginning to pull ahead. For the GOP, Donald Trump had an incredibly strong showing here in Massachusetts on Super Tuesday, earning 22 of the possible 42 delegates. Although the candidate has a massive lead, Republican Governor Charlie Baker claims he will not be endorsing the candidate, nor will he vote for him if he secures the nomination this fall. We spoke to Bay State voters about who they would like to see Baker endorse this coming election season. I know Donald, and he's a goofball, and I think he's great at business and he's really funny and he can be really extreme, you know, and say things that are really crazy. I would definitely make him, you know, the head of economic policy if, you know, if that was a possibility, but I would not want him to be president. At this point, I, my advice to Charlie would be step back, see how it plays out. I think it'd be great if he endorsed Kasich. I think Kasich is the only guy who may end up making sense. <laughs> I mean, our governor is very moderate or he wouldn't have gotten elected. He's a real pragmatist, and I, uh, I vote for pragmatists. You could make a statement by endorsing someone like Kasich, for example. Mm -hmm. right? I think that you know, politically it might not be uh, seen as wise on his side, given that he's not a leading candidate, but he could certainly make a statement by mm -hmm. supporting a moderate candidate. Mm -hmm. I'm glad he's speaking his own mind and not throwing support behind someone who may be getting popular vote, but is not an appropriate candidate to be the president of this country. Despite Governor Baker's refusal to endorse Donald Trump, he still took home a massive win in Massachusetts on Super Tuesday, securing 49.3% of the vote. Trump now holds an incredible lead over all remaining GOP candidates with 319 delegates secured so far. Trump now sets his sights to the March 5th caucuses of Maine, Louisiana, Kentucky, and Kansas. For EIV News, I'm Ross Ketchke.
That was Raj Keshke reporting. Now, Stacia, tell us a little bit about the Democratic side of things. Well, Trump's success may have come to a shock to Republicans, but Democrats weren't surprised that Hillary Clinton dominated in the polls on Super Tuesday. Like Trump, Clinton also won in seven of the 11 states that voted on Tuesday, with plenty of support stemming from the South. In the few states that Clinton didn't win, she still pretty much broke even with Bernie Sanders, except in Sanders' home state of Vermont, where he won all 10 delegates. Now, Clinton leads the delegate count with 1,052 delegates, while Sanders trails behind with 427. In the next few weeks, Clinton needs only to continue to break even with Sanders in the polls in Michigan, Ohio, and Florida for her to maintain her substantial lead. Results show that Clinton's greatest support stemmed from older and non-white voters, as well as women. But Bernie Sanders is still leading with young voters. That's right, Stacia. And speaking of Bernie Sanders, our reporter Christina Gesford was there at one of the many Tuesday viewing parties. Let's see what happened that day. While votes were being tallied for Massachusetts on Super Tuesday, Bernie Sanders supporters gathered at a Somerville hotel to watch the primary results and to celebrate volunteers' dedication to the campaign. Joe Chiazzo, state communications and political director for the campaign, thanked the staff for their excellent ground game. I know Senator Sanders is so proud of the people put together here in Massachusetts. Karen Higgins is a registered nurse in the Boston area and the co-president of National Nurses United. She's spoken for him on multiple occasions, singing his praise every step of the way. What you see is what you get. Bernie is not there to buy your votes. Bernie is there because what he's saying to you is, if you believe in me, vote with me and let's get this done. After hours of waiting for the results, Hillary Clinton was declared the victor in Massachusetts by a small margin, but supporters remained undaunted. No one with politics like Bernie Sanders has ever gotten this far in a presidential campaign in the entire history of the United States. Other supporters, like Jason Klebin of Cambridge, who has been volunteering on top of his full-time job, says that this is just the beginning for the Sanders campaign. So this election is definitely going to July. I plan on going to the other states and helping out a bunch. California is going to be massive. I can almost guarantee you I'll be out in California a bunch. With resounding wins in Vermont, Minnesota, Oklahoma, and Colorado, Bernie backers said they considered this Vermont Senator's Super Tuesday performance a success. Are you ready to Now, Stacia, after a disappointing Super Tuesday for Bernie Sanders, what's next for the senator from Vermont? While Hillary has secured her support from female and non-white voters, Sanders is still gaining plenty of momentum among voters of all demographics. After Super Tuesday, Sanders has recognized his need to boost support among non-white voters and senior citizens. To do this, Sanders, pl Sanders plans to talk about Social Security expansion and other senior issues before the Florida primary on March 15th, when 214 delegates are at stake. Sanders also believes he can appeal to voters in Michigan with his stance on social and economic issues and maybe win a chunk of the state's 130 delegates in the primary on March 8th. With a large number of Sanders college-aid supporters away on spring break during these critical elections, Sanders' biggest priority is definitely to gain the support of older voters. Thanks, Stacia. Now we're looking forward to seeing where the race goes, and I know you'll be keeping us updated as we inch closer to the general election. Now in related news... Bill Clinton may have violated election rules on Super Tuesday. The former president greeted people inside the Newton Free Library polling place during the elections, raising concerns that Massachusetts state campaigning rules were being broken. On election day, certain activities are prohibited within 150 feet of polling locations, including the, quote, solicitation of votes for or against or any other promotion or of opposition of any person or political party. After greeting voters outside, Clinton entered a polling station at Holy Name Parish School's gymnasium in West Roxbury alongside Mayor Marty Walsh. A video clip shows Clinton and Walsh shaking hands with election clerks and taking a couple of photos. Clinton and Walsh said they were strictly inside to thank the poll workers and not to campaign. After Chris Christie made the surprise decision to support Donald Trump, a new New Hampshire newspaper redacted their earlier endorsement of the New, Jer new Jersey governor. The New Hampshire Leader Union published an editorial on November 28th where they publicly disavowed Christie writing, quote, boy, were we wrong. Previously, the paper had said that Christie was right for these dangerous times, but after Christie backed Donald Trump in February, they took it all back. They wrote, quote, rather than standing up to the bully, Christie bent his knee. In doing so, he rejected the very principles of his campaign that attracted our support. 
Donald Trump may not be popular with some members of the GOP, but he has the support of at least one patriot. First, Tom Brady and now owner Robert Kraft. Kraft had nothing but praise for Trump going into Super Tuesday. Kraft says he does not discuss politics, but is comfortable talking about his friendships with people who happen to be in politics and counts Trump as a close friend since his wife's passing in 2011. Kraft is not officially endorsing Trump, but his announcement is causing controversy amongst Massachusetts voters. The Revenant was favored to win Best Picture at 2016 Oscars after the big win at the Golden Globes and picking up an Oscar for Best Actor, Directing and Cinematography. But it was Boston's own spotlight that claimed the spotlight and won Best Picture. A surprise after only winning one of its five other Oscar nominations for Best Original Screenplay, Spotlight is the first Best Picture winner in 63 years to walk away with only two Oscars. Mad Max Fury on the road was the big champion of the night, taking home six awards and Leonardo DiCaprio, who has been nominated six times by the Academy over the course of 22 years, finally won his Oscar. This film gave a voice to survivors, and this Oscar amplifies that voice, which we hope will become a choir that will resonate all the way to the Vatican. Cardinal Sean O'Malley praised the Academy Award-winning movie Spotlight for its portrayal of the Boston Globe's crucial uncovering of the clergy sexual abuse scandal that shook the Catholic community in 2001. The Cardinal said in a statement, quote, The media led the church to acknowledge the crimes and sins of its personnel and to begin to address its failings. Once again, O'Malley's comments come two days after Spotlight claimed Best Picture and Original Screenplay at the Oscars and drew mixed reactions from members of the clergy, survivors, and related actors. Advocacy groups. The MBTA governing board voted to stop providing late night tea service. The board has been discussing this plan for months and came to a unanimous decision Monday night. Cutting these services will save the MBTA up to $9 million next year and make it easier to perform repairs on the tea during the weekend. The decision was met with disappointment from Boston's residents who use public transport to get to and from nightlife and workers who have odd schedules. The new hours will be implemented by March 18th. A final report on the December runaway red line train has been released. The report says that the T driver wrapped a microphone cord around the control dial, causing the train to continue moving. Operator David Vasquez left the train unattended in order to, add, to activate an emergency bypass switch located on the exterior. Dispatchers were able to cut the power to the train, causing it to eventually come to a stop near North Quincy Station. Vasquez experienced a minor leg injury while avoiding the runaway train. He was fired after MBTA management determined he was at fault for the incident. And we're now joined by with uh, weather correspondent Joey Sack with our latest local temps. Joey? Anthony, Angelina, good evening to you both. Well, this winter has been a bit of a roller coaster temperature wise, especially during the month of February. One weekend there was a frostbite warning, the very next it was in the 50s and 60s, and this shows in the historical average temperatures for winter. This is the second warmest period from December to February that we have on record, with the average temperature for the past three months being 37.5 degrees. That is second only to the period between December 2001 and February 2002, when the average temperature was a bit warmer, 35.9 degrees. This winter also saw the most days in a meteorological winter where the temperature was warmer than 50 degrees, 35 days to be exact. And it's not just weird winter in terms of temperature. This is the 80th least snowy winter on record, and anyone who was in New England last year can attest to how much snow we had in January, February, and well into March. Well, where is that snow now? The answer is quite simple. It's not here because in meteorological terms, winter is well and truly over, a couple of weeks ahead of the official start of spring on March 20th. But I am getting way ahead of myself. Even with meteorological winter still being over, we're still going to have some cold weather coming our way because, let's face it, it's New England and it's what we've come to expect. Today it's partly cloudy, high of 34 and a low of 25 degrees with winds coming in between 10 and 25 miles per hour. All in all, not that bad today. I'll be back later on the broadcast to bring you tomorrow's weather and after that I'll give you a look at our five-day forecast. Back to you at the desk. Thank you Joey for that weather update. In other news, Two brothers are in police custody after they reportedly stole a checkbook during a break-in in a house with a dead body. Police claim that Stephen and Mark Landry broke into the house, noticed the dead body, and proceeded to steal the items. The two pleaded not guilty to the crime, despite the fact that the items belonging to the deceased were found at their residence. The Landry brothers' lawyers denied the allegations, claiming that the stolen items were already there when they had moved into the house. 
The city of Brockton has officially launched its champion plan. The Massachusetts town is offering treatments for residents suffering from opioid addictions rather than taking legal action. The program has been described as a platform for suffering individuals to come to police for help, offering assistance and a safe environment for rehabilitation. Brockton partnered with seven local treatment centers for the program and promises these individuals good care in helping them to get clean. The New Hampshire Department of Health has confirmed the first case of the Zika virus in the state. The virus can cause joint pains, rashes, fevers, and birth defects in pregnant women. An adult woman contracted the disease through sexual contact with a symptomatic man who had recently traveled to a country with heavy Zika activity. Officials from the Department of Health and Human Services say the woman has fully recovered and she is unlikely to have it spread to everyone else. A couple of Harvard students were recently diagnosed with the mumps. According to a statement from the university, two individuals enrolled in their divinity school were confirmed to have the illness. The Cambridge Public Health Department and Boston Department of Public Health have been alerted to the issue. This is not the first time in recent weeks a Massachusetts campus has reported incidents of the mumps. Two cases were also confirmed at St. Adam Anselm College last weekend. Harvard said it is working with local health agencies to identify the cause of the outbreak. And the Irish are going to be a little, le little less lucky this year. According to Mayor Marty Walsh, Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade route has been shortened for the sake of public safety. The route was abbreviated in 2015 due to snow pileup, and officers and emergency vehicles found it easier to patrol the less extensive path. The new route will stop at Farragut Square in South Boston and, not, and will not continue on the Dorchester Monument. Parade organizers claim they were not adequately informed of the decision ahead of the time and that the changes compromised the historical historical significance of the event. And still to come on EIV News, more documents have been released from the 2011 raid that killed Osama bin Laden. Find out the Al-Qaeda leader's dying wishes next on 9. And Logan Reba will be in the studio with an update on Aaron Andrews and the rest of your sports news. Lauren, hey, what are you doing? Uh, that I'm getting ready to host Good Morning Emerson, of course. Good Morning Emerson? What's that? Uh, it's the best morning show ever that's on Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Wow, how, can I work on this? Yeah, let's get going. <laughs> Red leather, yellow leather. Welcome back. We are now joined by our international correspondent, Camila Zagarzasu, for a look at what's going on in the world outside of Boston. Camila, what's the latest? Thanks, guys. Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden left a personal fortune of $29 million after his death in a raid in 2011, his will shows. The will is among a trove of documents recently released to U.S. media that was seized in the U.S. assault in Pakistan. Bin Laden urged his family to obey his will and spend the inheritance on jihad for the sake of Allah. He referred to the money as being in Sudan, but it's not clear whether it's in cash or assets. Other letters attributed to bin Laden and released Tuesday show that he urged Americans to fight catastrophic climate change to save humanity and feared a dentist had planted a tracking device in his wife's tooth. There were audible gasps Tuesday when Vatican Treasurer George Pell said a notorious Roman Catholic Church sex abuse case wasn't much of interest to him. The Australian Cardinal, the highest ranking Vatican official to testify on systemic sexual abuse of children by clergy, said senior clergy lied to him to cover up abuse in the 1970s. He insisted there was no reason for him to know the extent of the abuse carried out by his one-time roommate, 
pedophile priest Father Gerald Risdale, who was later convicted of 138 offenses against more than 50 children. Pell denied there was any discussion of Ridsdale being a pedophile at a meeting he attended in 1982 where it was discussed that Ridsdale should be moved to another parish. The buildup of thousands of migrants and refugees on Greece's northern borders is fast turning into a humanitarian disaster, the United Nations said Tuesday as the European Union prepared to offer more financial aid. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said clashes at Greece's border with Macedonia when migrants battered down a gate and were tear gassed simply underlined the urgency with which the EU needed to act on the crisis. But Austria, which last month limited the number of migrants it lets through to 3,200 a day, stuck to its position that it did not want to become an overcrowded waiting room for thousands wanting to make it further north. Now, Camila, I want to talk to you about abuse in the Catholic Church. Um, obviously, that is really big in the news right now. I want to know how Spotlight has reinvigorated that conversation. Well, it's funny that you mentioned Spotlight Angelina because the day that Pell started testifying was actually the day Spotlight won the Academy Award for Best Picture. So obviously, the discussion is there, the dialogue is there. Um, as you guys said before, our very own um, Cardinal here has been talking about the abuse and how it has to be in the media. Um, Lady Gaga's performance as well at the Academy Awards about sexual abuse, just raising this whole conversation that we need to have. This is still a very pressing issue. And so hopefully, this can continue on in the future. Thanks, Camila. Of course, a very important uh, scandal to continue talking about even today. Now, in other news, a renowned Boston chef is in hot water after being stopped at the Canadian border with nearly 23 pounds of marijuana edibles. Chef Timothy Maslow of Waltham is being charged with felony possession of marijuana after being apprehended in northern Vermont. Maslow now faces a misdemeanor charge for carrying depressants, stimulants, and narcotics. Maslow was recently named one of Food & Wine Magazine's Best New Chefs, and his Brookline restaurant, Rebel, was named Restaurant of the Year by the Boston Globe in 2013. Maslow is pleading not guilty to his charges. Loud footsteps could be linked to running injuries. A new study from Harvard Medical School and the National Running Center found that female runners who hit the ground with hard, sudden impact are more likely to be injured than soft landers. Scientists tracked the injuries of 250 female runners who ran more than 20 miles per week in order to track the correlation between the stride and sports injuries. Researchers suggest that the runners who experience consistent pain adjust their gait in order to prevent the further injury. According to a new report from the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, Brazilian butt lifts are on the rise. The number of people who received butt lifts and implants, as they've been named, rose 36% between 2014 and 2015. Butt augmentation saw a 28% increase in popularity in the same time frame, but buyer beware, surgeons say the procedure can lead to significant scarring and are usually recommended only for people who have recently lost a lot of weight. Well, Anthony, there's a lot of news that's going on in sports Absolutely. right now. Yeah. We're now going to be joined by our sports correspondent, Logan Reaver. Logan, what's the latest on the Aaron Andrews trial? Well, guys, the Aaron Andrews vs. Marriott trial continued this week and took quite the turn as Marriott's defense changed their tone. Marriott's new argument was that despite her emotional and physical distress, Andrews profited off of the peeping video. The new argument was so shocking that Andrews burst into tears and the trial was paused due to her crying. This comes after Andrews told the court that ESPN, her employer at the time, forced her to do an on-air interview with Oprah or they wouldn't let her return to work. I didn't know if who was doing this. I didn't know if somebody was going to hurt her even more. Um, after I saw what was happening, my thought was there's a stalker out there and that he's going to kill her. I was terrified for her safety. So we started calling ESPN, asking for security, um, and trying to get the video down. In slightly lighter news, the Boston Bruins are trying to make a run at the playoffs and help their chances. They made a couple of trades at the deadline. The Bees welcomed, welcomed in forward Lee Stepniak from the New Jersey Devils and defenseman John Michael Lyles from the Carolina Hurricanes. The Bruins traded their 2016 fourth round pick and 2017 second round pick to New Jersey and their third and fifth round picks in 2016 to the Hurricanes for their respective players. The biggest surprise of the deadline for sure was the retainment of forward Louis Erickson, who many experts pegged to get traded. It seems the Bruins are trying to go in with the all in to win this year, the cup mentality, whether or not the new blood mixes has, remains to be seen. And finally, the Red Sox attempt to win the 2016 World Series has began at the start of spring training. 
This year will be a big year of headlines for the team. A few notable topics heading into the season will be the performance of new ace David Price, the potential comeback seasons for troubled stars Hanley Ramirez and Pablo Sandoval, and how well the outfield of Rusty Castillo, Mookie Betts, Jackie Bradley Jr., and Chris Young can all mesh together and play well. The Sox are hoping for a better end to the season than last year, which ended with no playoffs and a last place finish. Thanks, Logan. Now, Big Poppy is a big question going into 2016. What's the, the Slugger's outlook uh, for next season? Well, guys, I mean, we're going to have this whole farewell tour, so it's, it's more or less about his health and more just playing enough games because the fans are definitely going to want to see Poppy play in its last game, whether it be different ballparks. So it's less about his health and more about the actual show of Poppy coming into the year. But no matter where he goes, expect a big show, whether he hits big or not. Thank you for that, Logan. And when we come back, our entertainment correspondent, Ashley LaShawn, will have the latest in entertainment. And Joey Sack will be back again, this time with our five-day forecast. All this and more coming up after the break. Hello everyone, welcome to this season of College Kitchen. I'm your host, Amelia Fabiano. And I'm Aaron Kenigsberg. College Kitchen is a show where we're going to take you around Boston to show you all the hottest food spots. Uh, whether that is man food, which is your burgers, your bacon, your meat, all that grease, yes. Or like Sweet Talk, where we'll show you <laughs> sweet tooth lovers where to get your cake fix, your ice cream fix, all that good stuff. We also have Wild Card, which is your ticket to food from all over the world. Or if you're on a budget, like I know I am, we'll take you <laughs> in the kitchen with Alyssa to show you how to make college food on a budget. So sit back, relax, and enjoy College, college Kitchen. kitchen. Welcome back to EIB News at 9. We're now joined by our entertainment correspondent, Ashley LaShawn. Ashley? What's going on around Boston? Well, you guys, it has been crazy since here in Boston. Ben Affleck arrived at his post-Oscars Jimmy Kimmel appearance with a much larger silhouette than usual this past Sunday, which actually turned out to be longtime BFF Matt Damon strapped all the way to his chest. What hey, is hey, this? Why, why are you touching me? Well, I'm not touching you. Uh, no, sit. I want everyone to sit down. Nobody, no clapping. This silly stunt was an attempt on Affleck's part to ease the infamous feud between the show host and his bestie. Despite the applause and laughter from the audience, Kimmel was not amused. And in the recent trend of sequels and reimaginings of classic films, Boston-based movie The Departed is up next on the Hollywood chopping block. Producer Roy Lee has decided to revisit the concept behind this Academy Award-winning film and bring it to television in a brand new way. Taking cues from FX's adaptation of Fargo, this version of The Departed will be a complete reworking of the material, which means it will not take place in Boston or feature any of the same characters. So expect something fresh and new and Departed-esque. Have you ever wanted to be an official East High Wildcat? Well, your dream just come, might come true. The official High School Musical franchise is back, set to air on Disney Channel, and they are holding a nationwide casting call that will allow you to be among Gabriella, Troy, and friends. Now, Ashley, is there any rumors at all about when this casting call could be or its potential date? Well, the call has been announced this past Tuesday, and cities are popping up. We've heard about Los Angeles and New York. We're hoping that it might come to the bean, because I need to get my tap dance on, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> of course I know what you mean. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Ashley. It's been a long week already, so Angelina, what better way to end your Thursday than hitting the sack? We've got Joey Sack back with his five-day forecast. Take it away, Joey. Well, as hoped, I have a good report for you, my five-day forecast. It's going to take a little while, but you'll see the bright side to my report if you just stick with me. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a high of 35 and a low of 25 degrees with a 50-50 chance of snow showers, but those probably won't even amount to an inch. Saturday will be partly cloudy with a high of 39 and a low of 27. Sunday will be partly cloudy during the day, high of 41, low of 29 degrees, and those clouds should mostly clear by Sunday evening. Monday is where temperatures start to warm up a bit, high of 51 and a low of 36, partly cloudy during the day and evening. And Tuesday is that bright side I was talking about, partly cloudy with a high of 58 and a low of 44 degrees. And without giving way too much, it's going to only get better from there. Well, that's all I got for you today. I'm, I'm weather correspondent Joey Sack. Back to you at the desk.
Thank you so much for that, Joey. That's all we have on EIV News at 9. I'm Angelina Salcido. And I'm Anthony Monzon. Thank you for watching and good night.